Today, we're going to do a few things. I'm going to start with referencing and cross-referencing um, because, of course, we've had uh, our part about the literature. So, um, and after that, I'm going to go into some more advanced topics uh, with referencing. And after that, I have a few uh, requests that we received on the poll uh, that I didn't do yet. So these are more advanced things such as uh, styling your page layout, uh, fancy header, some, mostly some packages and how to include uh, code. Also there was uh, a request how to sync Overleaf with GitHub, so I'm going to look at that. Um, and there was a, a, a few questions about positioning. So let's just get started with referencing and first a little recap on cross-referencing because most of the references in your document will probably be um, cross-references. I'm, I'm slowing down because I, I, uh, I, I can hear some chatter about uh, the qualifications, I think. <laughs> I, I understand, but uh, I'd like to talk about uh, cross-references. So, um, we've seen this last time. Basically, you can put in labels on certain parts, such as figures, sections, tables, and then reference back to them. So those are the references that you find in your document that go to your own document. And then we saw with the hyperref package, we can actually make these links clickable, so you can go through your document easily. <clears throat> we also looked at the cleverref package, where you can style these uh, links a bit more. Um, so that's where we kind of left off. There was also a thing with this and I saw some, um, maybe some mistakes or, uh, or uh, things that can go wrong with this. And I just had one yesterday, so I'm going to show you. Um, in here, I'm wanting to reference to this, this picture. So basically I have a bit, bit of text and then I reference to this picture. Only if you can look here in the text, it says section 1.1.2. Well, clearly I have my reference correct because here there's figure mil ervaren and here I labeled that inside my figure object. So if you come across this, this is some, some common error and this happens because of the way that LaTeX processes these labels. So um, one important thing in the labels, for instance, of figures is that they need to be placed after your caption command. Well, if I can look through my code over here, I hope you can see it, but there is no actual caption command. That's because I didn't want a caption in my figure. Well, how to solve this? Uh, well, basically there's another caption command that does not produce a caption, but still does so internally. And if I use that one and then recompile my document, then it actually figures out that this label belongs to this figure and not to the next best thing that it finds, which would be the sub subsection conclusions. So, and now you can see that the label is fixed. These are some, some mistakes that you might find with these uh, internal references. That's why I, I wanted to show it real quick. Um, but usually you place a reference either after a uh, section subsection command or for some some uh, other environments you place them in front of them yeah there's a question but if you now reference to figure one and you have no caption why would the all the caption figure one at the picture start to be so uh, basically here there is a figure uh, figure this one which is internally figure one but nowhere else it is shown Usually I would not do this caption list entry, but I would do caption and then um, say, okay, this is uh, some figure. And then of course you would get, um, if it compiles, you would get this fig figure one formatting in there. Uh, Actually, uh, you can say maybe this is not really properly done. I should have made the caption be this so that it 
understands um, figure one, this is male met ervaring, this actually belongs to that picture. So that would maybe be better and then uh, it would make more sense. But in this case I was lazy and I just wanted um, to have an example for you, <laughs> basically. Yeah. If the caption is not there and it says in, uh, in the text like, hey, this can be found in figure one and there's no caption that says that figure yeah, one, that, and how does someone know if it's... Exactly. So this example doesn't completely make sense, but you might have... Um, the, the main point here is if I were to move this label in front of my caption command, then LaTeX would basically not understand anymore. So here I labeled my figure and you might think, oh, I labeled it correctly, but now it references back to section 1.1.2 instead of figure one. Okay, so um, that was the thing about internal referencing. Of course, the next thing is external referencing. And this is to your uh, analysis will be uh, a common theme because of course we want to use sources that we find on the internet or in books and well, we use these books but maybe your electronics book um, and we want to reference them in our text well Luke said Casper uh, will probably talk a lot about how you need to reference them uh, that is partly true I will talk about how do you do it in LaTeX but you will see that LaTeX does most stuff for you so um, if you really want a, a quick bibliography with a reference you can use this begin bibliography environment and specify the number of references and then use bbtem or I <laughs> really bib item uh, and input it like this However, I, I don't recommend this. I recommend you pretty much immediately switch to a separate bibliography file because it will make things very much easier later on. And for more and complex references, we can use the bibtech package. Um, so the bibtech package will um, allow you to use bib files. Now, this is an example of a bib file and in here, basically, uh, an article is defined with information belonging to this reference. There is a question right now. What's the difference between BibTeX and ZipLab? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can address this in, in, in uh, just a minute. I will get to that. Um, so why would you want to do this? Why not just type the text of the, bib, uh, of the uh, reference? Maybe somebody has an idea. Why wouldn't we just immediately type the correct way that we need to reference? Yeah? So we can apply a different style, you think? Yes, exactly. Again, LaTeX allows this separation of content and styling. And here we can have a certain entry of, uh, of our reference and later on we can apply different styles and we can just share our bib file with somebody else or one of those entries with somebody else they can use it in their own documents without having to worry about anything basically except using backslash site to cite in their um, in their text so we'll, we'll see that first there are many different types of uh, entries that you can have in your bibliography because we might want to apply a different format of text for each one of these entries we differentiate between them and uh, some uh, highlighted examples here are articles for scientific ar uh, articles books perhaps your uh, electronics or circuit analysis book um, and you also have MISC which basically uh, I think websites uh, can fall under this and for each of those entries that we, we saw, we also have um, these fields. So these fields specify something about this um, reference. And uh, well, they're, here they're listed a lot. Some of them are required, perhaps the author or the, um, uh, for instance, with a book, the author field is required. Or um, uh, with a, uh, 
website, perhaps the place where you got it from might be a required parameter or field. And um, there's something else that you can do. Uh, if you want to specify a URL, um, you would put this in the how published field and you can use the Euro backslash URL with your uh, URL and this makes use of the hyperref package which creates a clickable link. So here uh, you can see an example where basically a reference is defined and then used and um, this will produce the following uh, text with this clickable link. Now, what is, oh, um, I forgot this important part. How do you cite, actually make use of your references? Well, in this bib file, you define all of your references one time and you provide this citation key. So this is the top part here after the article. And this citation key is then used inside your text when you use backslash cite. Now, depending on how you do your formatting, LaTeX will do the rest for you. So there's two things you need to do. Create your BibTeX entry for the reference you want to use. And next, so that's basically creating this. And then in your text, you can only have to use backslash site with this citation key. <clears throat> now, the difference between BibTeX and BibLaTeX or not Bib, there are a lot of packages that can do bibliography management for you. Uh, basically, the, this is again the distinction between uh, how the file kind of is formatted and how um, that is. Uh, it, it's, it's similar to the, the way that uh, LaTeX differs from Lua LaTeX and uh, other interpreters. Basically, BIP LaTeX or not BIP is a package that can use this entry to create your, um, uh, your bibliography list or the way you format your citation keys. So the, uh, even though the entries might be the same in BIPTech, um, you might have different packages that interpret this in a different way. So I'm going to show you mostly um, uh, the default way, or, and I will have an example with not, uh, not lib. Um, so we have this text with citations. Now somewhere in our document we want the bi bibliography list. So we can use one of these commands um, and we can specify the style of bibliography. So here's where this later part comes useful. We have a few different styles. Uh, one of them is the plain style, which is kind of the default styling and it looks like this. So in your text you will have uh, you know, basically your typing and you use backslash site to, for instance, Albert Einstein. Um, and it will, be pro it will produce this here, this uh, a key of one. And later on where you defined your bibliography list, it will look somewhat like this with all the numbers and the references. Now, you can also have an APA-like uh, style, which will produce two different things. First of all, the numbering in the text will be different, but also your bibliography list will be a bit different and look more like the APA style. Of course, we don't care about any of these two. We care about this style, IEEE TREN, because uh, like Luke said, you want to do this in a particular way. Well, we want to do it in the electrical engineering way. So we use the, um, basically the default way that every electrical engineering article uses their reference listing. And if we specify this reference style, we will just get that for free and we don't need to worry about it. We just make our bibtech file and use our citation commands. And it will look somewhat like this, so with the nice square braces and no nonsense and just one uh, reference part at the end where the square braces and the numbers are explained. <clears throat> so how do we actually get these entries? There are many different ways. We can just write them ourselves. So we can just start typing uh, this in the format in, in, in the way. But I will show you a few ways how I like to do it because I'm lazy. 
Um, and one of those is to, with the program Mendeley. So maybe you already use this for word reference managing. There, um, they have a sort of a library where you can add well, documents and um, some information is automatically retrieved from that document. Other information you can add yourself and then you can have better word referencing. Well, it also works together with uh, creating BibTeX entries and it also can be used uh, immediately with uh, Overling, o Overleaf. Um, so here's the example. If you create an account and go to your library page, it will look something, something like this. And now I can add a file, for instance. And maybe I want to add Einstein's general relativity. So I can upload this file and it will add here a reference. Oh, it's an English translation. Um, so it automatically got the uh, date from the from within the file and some information from within the file but I'm not completely happy with it because I think Einstein should also at least be um, in the authors list so uh, there's I can I can add that I can add maybe some additional information if I want to this reference and then when I'm finished I can just copy the BibTeX entry I can also do something else I can go to my Overleaf menu and then sync. Oh, um, currently, maybe I. Sh I don't know where exactly. Oh, yeah, here. I can import from Mendeley and um, add my entire bibliography, bibliography file from Mendeley. So if I look at that, it would look something like this. And basically now I let Mendeley take care of this entire BIP tech uh, bibliography file. <clears throat> if I then add in my uh, Mendeley, if I now add this reference to, for instance, a certain project I'm working on, and then here click on refresh, then um, now this Einstein uh, entry is added to my uh, to my file automatically. So that's, a, a, that's sometimes that can be a, a nice way, but um, I don't know, sometimes Mendeley doesn't really pick up the right information and it can be useful to just fill it in yourself. But actually the best uh, way to do this is just to go for your, to your Google Scholar where you're searching your articles. And then I can just press this neat little citation key and I can just click on BibTeX and I get my uh, BibTeX entry completely filled in by Google. So um, that's also uh, quite useful. <clears throat> um, so uh, an example would be, for instance, uh, I can have this, I can cite this uh, experiment. Um, of course, I need to copy it. And then I would go to my uh, file where I want to reference it go to the bib file and just paste it in here. Now I can see here my citation key, so maybe I just want to, to uh, rename it to something I can just remember, uh, like ash. And then somewhere within my uh, document I would just go, uh, perhaps in the introduction here I'm citing a certain uh, thing about, uh, well, for in this case, solar panels. <clears throat> Okay, uh, did you guys, by the way, get to see this Sci-Hub page last week with, the, with how to find sources on the internet? Then maybe, uh, uh, then you don't have this from me <laughs> because it's not strictly speaking legal, I think. But um, if you go to Google Scholar and you find an article, here I can see, oh, this Ash experiment. I can read this for free if I just click on the PDF file. And if you log in with your University of Twente account, you can get quite a lot of articles uh, for free. And you can also register with quite a lot of places where you can get just read articles. So, um, but this one I can just read. But there might also be um, articles I find on here that I have to pay for. Um, well, I can just 
copy the link and paste it in here and and you didn't see that um, so it's always a site that gets taken down constantly but you can always find it if you just google it um, so that might be useful for your report as well um, Okay, so far a bit about uh, referencing. I will show you one last part, and that is here in my um, in my uh, report for the Soda project. What I actually did here is I used the notbib place for referencing because I wanted uh, a certain uh, formatting change, and I basically said use package. Okay, I want uh, the ones with square and numbers, and then. After this, somewhere, I have defined the bibliography style. Well, this was this IEEE trend with a certain uh, extra N. This base has uh, a kind of sub file, a sub uh, style. And here you can see how that then, um, okay, that's interesting. Well, at the end, this would create a um, bibliography with the correct styling. And I, oh, this is, uh, no, you're not supposed to see that yet. I think, yeah, over here, you can see the kind of references that are produced. Um, now, I can uh, show you something that I told about two times before before but I uh, never really properly showed it. Um, this file uses many subfiles, and uh, we want these bibliographies in all these. Uh, you maybe want a, um, for instance, to work on your introduction in a separate file. Well, how do you then show your uh, bibliography entries correctly? <clears throat> well, what I did was basically I have one main bibliography um, that is used in the main document and this produces this references at the end. But when I get to one of these subfiles, I have a certain command here at the end which is called subbib. I created this command myself and if I compile one of these subfiles, for instance the analysis, which would be the analysis you are also writing for your solo project, then I can see, oh, I only get my, um, my document with my analysis for uh, for the solar inverter. And then at the end, again, I get my reference. So in this case, my references in my text are already working properly. And I can just click on them and go to the uh, reference file. So what I did is in the main file, I created a command. Um, if I just search for it, subbib. And basically, I said, OK, this subbib command, if I use it, it will just make a bibliography, like I did in my main file. But I can use this in all of my subfiles because the subfiles uh, use this subfile package. They will copy the entire preamble of the document to their subfiles, therefore also have the command, access to the command subbib and create this subbib. Then in my main document, I said, okay, after the preamble, I say, okay, now this, this command subbib doesn't mean anything anymore. And that will make sure that you don't get your subfile references, another subfile references, and so on. But you will get just all your subfiles after each other and one big references at the end. So that would be a, a solution to fix your references in subfiles. Okay, let's go on to no more references, I think we handled this enough now. And um, there were some questions about floating in LaTeX. Well, this was the slide that I showed last time and um, it has all kinds of specifier. Well, let's look at what is the common problem that people have with floating. And I just have an example here. So here I have a piece of text and as you can see there, I want the top part, I want this above the picture, and the last part, I want that after the picture. But if you can see, uh, you can see here that LaTeX just does its own thing, and 
this text should be in front of the image. Okay, that's fine. And then this part should be after. Well, it's kind of split up in a weird way that I don't want. How to fix this? Well, I already said a H, so I should place this image here. If I don't do this, for instance, put a T, then this image will not be here, but it will be forced to go on the top of the page. Well, that we also didn't want. We want the text, then the image, and then the other part of the text. So um, if I go back to the slide, okay, maybe I want to override the internal parameters. So I'm going to say H exclamation mark. And well, still nothing really happened. And that's because LaTeX has some sort of formatting rules um, that prevent this from working. Perhaps if I make really uh, clear that this is a different par paragraph, then it would actually go to the, uh, to the other part. I don't need so many enters, but to show you, okay, this, because LaTeX thinks this is one paragraph of text, it has a certain formatting for this image. Well, I can also fix it in another way, and that is to use the package float. So I need to say huge package float. And this grants me access to not the H and H exclamation mark, but the capital H, which says, I don't care what you say, just place it here and don't uh, do, <laughs> do anything else. And this is usually the fix for the issue. So now you can see again that the part that should be after actually is after. So I hope this will fix most of those uh, errors that people have with, um, with placing images and tables. Yes? Um, yeah, it looks like that. It looks, um, maybe that's one of the things that it does. Um, so maybe the, the question would be how to remove this part of indentation. Yeah. Ooh. Well, of course, now the, the new paragraph would work. And it also works with the uh, lower H. If I do it like this, um, this produces the same result. But... Um, Yeah, I think. There, if you, I, I am pretty much, I'm, I'm like 80% sure there's some kind of solution online for this. So it, it or probably 99% sure. Um, the thing is, this in this case, I can just use an enter and create a new paragraph, and it would be fixed. Sometimes you're working perhaps with multiple images and something weird goes wrong. Usually the capital H with the float package will take care of that the actual order that you put them in will be the order that you see them on the final document. <clears throat> um, I can look up for the no indentation, but I will do that after the lecture. So, something else that we might want to do, and that's to style our document layout a bit differently. So basically, if I, if I just take a normal LaTeX document with the article class, um, I show this here, it looks like this. And there is uh, a good, some people like it, but uh, what I think is it's a huge, huge waste of space because uh, you have like a padding of multiple inches or, or at least more than one inch. Um, and I don't really, uh, if, if I have bad eyesight, I can't really read the text. So what I can do is something that I did over here as well. And when I'm using my geometry, uh, I can specify uh, use package geometry, and I can say, okay, I want this document to be A4 paper, and I want the top margin to be one inch, the bottom margin to be one inch, the left margin to be 0 0.5 inch, and now I get this kind of document that is a lot larger. So even though I am uh, using the article class, the article class might on default say, okay, it's this really cramped article, uh, but I override this with the geometry package and I say, okay, I want to basically have these margins a certain way. Now, why wouldn't you do this? Well, basically, um, there are 
places where you want to publish maybe your article and those usually have very strict styling rules. So for instance, if I want to publish my article to the IEEE uh, journal thing, uh, I can also, um, uh, yeah, if you want to publish your, your article to a scientific journal, then they have these stricting styling rules, so they can actually give you a class, maybe a LaTeX class, or say you need to use this LaTeX part, and write your document in it, and then not change any of the styling rules yourself, because then you're no longer adhering to their styling rules. Uh, but in most of the documents we write, we are a little bit free to change at least some parts. And one instance is here. Now another cool thing is the uh, fancy header package. So basically, um, you can see an example already here. Um, on default, there is nothing on the page. Maybe there is a, um, a page numbering. This is actually provided by the article default class. but. Uh, I wanted my uh, section headings to be, for instance, on the top left. And I wanted the main title of my document to be on the top right. Well, a way to go about that is using the fancy header package. And then I have a few commands that specify how the page should look. So for instance, my head height is 15 pixels or PT, um, not, not pixels, but, uh, and that would be this height basically uh, how much space the header actually takes up. And I also say, okay, so the left head, this part, um, should be, uh, should consist of the right mark. Well, what is the right mark? Basically, every time my LaTeX interpreter comes across a certain section, it's going to run internally the command section mark. I use that fact to mark right this section mark and therefore every time that I use right mark somewhere in my text I will get the last section that we came across and then I use this on the left head of my fancy header and on the right head I just use the title which is just the command that I sp specified earlier the consisting of the title of my document. Now I also say, okay, the head rule width, so this line is 2 pt, and the foot line is 1 pt, and in the center of my footing, I want the page, which just gives the page number. Well, this is kind of the stuff that you can do in LaTeX. It seems kind of complicated, so just search it online how you want it, and you'll probably find it. But uh, to give you an idea of the possibilities, you can really style your document uh, quite a lot if you just take the time to, to look it up sometime. Um, so another cool thing with styling is these boxes. And that was one of the requests, how do you make these fancy boxes? Well, here's an example of a fancy box. And it's just with this really popular package, T-Color Box. It's also used a lot, uh, maybe in your uh, electronics or circuit analysis book. Those are written, I think, entirely in LaTeX. Uh, and also a lot of mathematics textbooks, you often see these blocks with equations or uh, figures in them with certain styling. Well, a lot of them are actually using this package. And instead of uh, going really in depth, I just want to show you the manual of this package. Of course, written completely in LaTeX using the package itself. And you can already see the enormous amount of possibilities with just how you can make these boxes and all the um, different kinds of properties you can apply to them. This manual is really uh, expansive, but if you, if you want a certain thing, it's in there and you can just copy the example over and then have your environment defined and then just use that in your LaTeX document. So pretty cool, I think. Um, Another thing that you're probably going to use this time is maybe some Arduino code for your uh, boost converter maybe, or some MATLAB code to simulate something and you want to include this in your report. Well, I already showed you the LST listing um, that, 
uh, I think, yeah. I already showed you the LSD listing part that produces this. So basically in my document I can say I'm going to begin a certain environment that has LSD listing. I specify here the language is Arduino and then I, I copied this uh, Arduino code in there. I can also of course in this use an input statement to just upload the file to my uh, overleaf or place where I'm working and then uh, not have the file clutter of my actual tech file. But the point here is where does this styling rules for this language come from? Well, they're not here on default. You either have to define them yourself. So for instance, for LaTeX, I made my own rules here and these are called, so basically I say, okay, there's some sort of keywords, they have a certain coloring. Um, and if you come across them, you would have to apply royal blue coloring or there's another keyword style. Well, you can find how you need to do online. You can also just copy a certain styling sheet from somebody else. For instance, here this Arduino language.tech file, which is quite long, but I just copied this from the internet and it gave me all the styling rules to give a pretty nicely formatted Arduino code. The same is true for MATLAB or any other language that, uh, that you want to use uh, and put some code in your document. <clears throat> okay, so uh, another part was something uh, that was requested, an advanced feature, how to sync Overleaf with GitHub. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible from within the program actually. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, perhaps you're working together with somebody who doesn't use Overleaf but is very fond of his own editor on his own computer. Uh, or perhaps you're, um, you want to have a better storage of all the different changes you made to your file. Well, in that case, you can uh, connect them and actually do commits. Um, I will just briefly go over how to do this. It's, it's not that hard. You just go to Overleaf, maybe make a new project, or you can already import it from GitHub. Maybe there is a certain uh, repository that already has tech files in it. You can just import it in Overleaf. But for now, I'm going to make a, a blank project, um, GitHub test two. And when I create this uh, project, I can just go to menu and, well, I can click Git. Now I can immediately clone the repository from Overleaf or I can go to GitHub and it detects that, oh, it's not linked to a repository yet, so I can create it. Well, this is fine. And I can put it to public if I want to create a repository. The first time you do this, of course, it will ask you to log in with GitHub. But now I can see immediately it created this a repository with uh, the main file in it. Well, I can now um, make some changes here and then comes the part where I, I think it's, it's still lacking a bit of features, but to commit them you go over to here and push the changes, you can type some commit message. And if I just refresh this page, you can see, okay, now the commit is done and it's changed. And of course, it also works the other way around. So I can edit this file here, do some commit. And then I need to load this page again. It will show me that there are changes on GitHub and I can pull them in. Unfortunately, there's no real support for merge conflicts. So if that happens, it will ask you to fix them yourself, which kind of means either you will go onto your command prompt, clone the repository on your OPC, fix the merge errors and push it again, or go to GitHub and use the resolve manager in GitHub and then uh, fix your mistakes or fix the merge errors that way. Um, but still, it can be quite nice if you want to either, of course, work together with somebody who doesn't use Overleaf or just store your different versions a bit better. Now there's also uh, inside Overleaf, uh, maybe I already showed this, I don't know, but there is a history 
Um, so this is also a very useful tool to find out if maybe some of your project group has only typed five lines in the entire report. So uh, yeah, be cautious with that. Um, last but not least, I made a promise last or two weeks ago that I upload, will upload the presentation source. I still intend to do that, uh, only there were a few errors and I didn't have time to fix them yet. So I will upload them when I have fixed the errors. But in the meantime, how do you do emojis? <laughs> well, you can use the package emoji and then you can just do backslash emoji and the emoji name. <laughs> So it's, it's not that hard, but you do need uh, the Lua Tech compiler. So if you want to do this, you need to go to menu and change the compiler to Lua Tech. And then you can use the package emoji. And actually, um, well, I don't know, somewhere use uh, an emoji. And of course, this is quite a large document, so I'm never going to find it again. But then you get the nice emojis. And uh, I think I'd like to uh, end my, my course on that note. Um, I hope you all have a, a nice project and get some good grades for your reports because they look really fancy and well because you made them with LaTeX. Are there any more? Questions or requests? <laughs> yes? Uh, maybe something on the templates or style? Because I was wondering how you would approach it, for example, for all these. Would it be a good idea to just do it yourself or grab something already made? And where would you look for it? Well, okay, so um, uh, the part I said. Uh, if you want to publish your article, usually they give you a template. Um, also, I believe some of our modules actually say, hey, here's a template, here's a later template, you can use this. And then sometimes you're feel still free to, to choose yourself if you want to do that. If you publish your article uh, you're in a journal, then usually it's not a good idea to completely go overboard. But you can still maybe change a few things. Um, of course, you can make your own templates. So there, you can define your own document classes and have uh, these default styling rules, for instance, uh, your margin, your, uh, what kind of font is used, um, how, how the page numbers are shown, whatever. You can, you can make that entirely yourself. And I just, yeah, you can, I recommend copying it from somebody else, but if you want to, you can of course make it completely your own. What I usually do is use one of the built-in and um, built-in uh, classes such as article, and then um, change it up a little bit with, for instance, the fancy header and the geometry package. And I can also show you um, uh, a different kind of lab, for instance, the Segway project. I think it was with a different document class. Yeah, so here I use journal instead of article and you can see that that changes your uh, document layout a lot if it just wants to compile. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Ah, it did. Um, so a journal uh, might look uh, somewhat like this and on default have a two column layout. Um, there's also a, a, a very nice package that's called Multicol and um, you can use this to have certain sections with one column, for instance the introduction of your article have one column and then specify two columns. Well, you can still use that in the article uh, document class 
and then uh, well create a wholly different formatted kind of document. I, I personally like this one a lot because it looks really much like a, a, a scientific paper with the two columns and figures that you can just do one figure in the text and not have huge white spaces around it. Um, but yeah, so you, it's your own decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The margin was pretty much non existent. Uh, and I was wondering if there are multiple approaches to, to adjust the styling, if, if, if there's any other. Yeah. Something to avoid maybe not doing? Um, well, I, I, don't, I haven't seen your code, but if you just use the regular way of making a table, like the normal way, then it's probably just how the formatting is defined for this document class or uh, rules. And there probably are multiple fixes. Either you can like burn it in uh, by just using a backslash uh, horizontal vertical space or um, saying a big skip or something. It's big skip creates a, a, a sort of skip. <laughs> Uh, so you can try that, but maybe the more correct solution would be to go uh, and search for how do I change the formatting of my tables and then um, have this, probably there's some kind of variable that is the margin of your table and you can use renew command to change that command that produces that gap to be larger. So there's, there's probably a solution like that. Uh, and then everywhere where you do a table, it would be fixed because you change the general styling of, of how the table looks. Um, I'm wondering, are all of you making the report in LaTeX? Yeah? Oh, that's cool. I, I, I looked through a few of your reports and already saw a lot of nice, uh, uh, nice documents <laughs> appearing. <laughs> Well, um, then I think I'm, uh, I'm finished and I wish you all a very nice break. <laughs>